Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session. Today, we're going to study on two books, on the book of Ecclesiastes and the book of Song of Solomon. So before we could uh, proceed, can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Can I request Zeli Tuli to lead us in prayer? Father God, I come before your presence in the name of Jesus. I thank you so much for this session that you have blessed us. You bless our pastor as she teaches from the books, Lord, of Exodus, Sisters, and Song of Solomon, Lord. And also, Lord, bless each one of us so that our hearts are receptive. And also, Holy Spirit, teach us, guide us, Lord. We commit our life, our time, everything into your caring to Lordship. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you so much. So I just present a PowerPoint as I start to share. So we're going to study on the book of Ecclesiastes and um, yeah, so the Song of Songs, sorry, we're going to study on two books, book of Ecclesiastes and the book of Song of Songs. So the book of Ecclesiastes is a part of our Bible wisdom literature and it opens with a line and when we see in uh, chapter one, verse one, the word of Kohelet the son of King David in Jerusalem. Now, in Hebrew, the word Kohelet means someone who has gathered people together. And in this case, it's to learn. So it's often translated in English as a teacher or a preacher. And the teacher is said to be the son or a descendant of King David, and that's King Solomon. I'll just accept some of them have joined now. Yeah. Uh, so a man, uh, Solomon was a man with a great wisdom and he probably wrote this book toward the end of his life at a very old age after uh, trying different things and in search for satisfaction. And then finally, he understood uh, uh, what is the meaning of life. So with that learning, he writes this book called Ecclesiastes. So we need to recognize that the teacher is a character in the book and is different from the author. So when we look at uh, chapter one, so uh, uh, or the, through the chapters, this book has about 12 chapters and we see uh, what does this book talk about. So we do hear the voices of two voices, one, the teacher's voice and then the author's voice. So the teacher's voice is most of the book. It's actually uh, different from the author's vo voice and the author introduces the teacher in the first sentence and then he ends up again in the uh, last chapter towards the conclusion. And uh, we can summarize this all by the conversation between the author and the teacher. So one thing that commonly runs throughout the book is the word called vanity 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 so let's see uh, the overview of this book So in the overview, uh, we see that the 12 chapters have been split. The first uh, chapter 1 to 2 it talks about vanity is explained. And then chapter 3 to 6, we see vanity explored. And then chapter 7 to 9, we see vanity expanded. And chapter 10 to 12, we see vanity exonerated. Well, we see different themes here. As we talk about this book, we can see many of these things been covered as we start to explain. So the author is someone who wants us to hear all that the teacher has to say and then helps us process it from uh, our own conclusion so that uh, the teacher, what the teacher has to say. So in chapter one, we see the author summarizes the teacher's basic message. 
saying at the beginning uh, and uh, at the beginning and at the end it talks about vanity and vanity and all is vanity so now in english bible we see this word called vanity been translated saying it's meaningless or emptiness so in hebrew what is this uh, vanity all about in hebrew uh, vanity literally means vapor or a smoke and the teacher uses this word about 38 times in this book and it is a metaphor to describe how life is uh, first of all a temporary or a fleeting like wisp of smoke but secondly also how life is as enigma or a paradox like uh, uh, like a smoke that appears uh, appears to be solid but actually when we try to grab it there's nothing there so there's so much beauty or goodness in the world but just when we are enjoying it we see uh, sometimes a, stra a tragedy strikes and it seems to be everything been blown away shattered and uh, you know it's all vanity and we have a strong uh, sense of justice but sometimes uh, we see bad things happen to good people in life even we would have seen it in our own eyes or we would have experienced in our own self sometimes uh yes for some of us so um constantly life has been very unpredictable and unstable for some so the teacher here in other words he's saying uh we all are chasing behind vanity so we may wonder why the author is saying all this the author what is the author's basic goal to target all this uh he is talking about the purpose of our life uh when we uh, purpose of our life is we need to uh, set god in middle of our life because everything around this vanity see so that is the main purpose of this whole book um i just see somebody has placed a request okay to admit him yeah so the author thinks we spend most of our time uh, <clears throat> investing our energy our emotion our money in things around us and which ultimately has no meaning no significance like uh, we go in search of wealth pleasure status career position and we try to strive in our daily life to achieve one of one or the other things but then the teacher gives us a hard lesson in reality in life that is everything around is vanity and we don't have to chase around uh, all these things because ultimately uh, everything will end when uh, when we hit the hard core of death so later part we also see the teacher uh, say uh, talks about you know uh, we may spend a whole life working and achieving uh, striving to achieve certain things certain dreams in our life and we may think uh, these are uh, these will make most uh, uh, meaningful sense in our life so here the author the teacher is saying uh, telling us we need to stop and reconsider think again what we are striving to do every day in our life what are we going to achieve out of this if you are a developer you may develop a technology and uh, you may build a, a uh, uh, if you are a leader you may build a big nation and so whatever it is <clears throat> as per the phase of life that we are in there may be a rise and there may be a fall but here the author is asking us to rethink now there may be a big mountain and we may start climbing on that mountain and we may reach a success which no one else have walked that path or climbed that mountain and we have achieved something in our life but then what happens what happens we may get down off that mountain we may have succeeded we may have been recognized for that but then what happens the mountain will be there okay it means nothing so 100 years pass by what happens by now that mountain that we climbed is still there the ocean that we uh, explored 
is still the same. The sun that is shining over us is still the same. It rises and it sets. But then eventually, whatever we thought is success, whatever we thought will establish a name for us, will eventually slowly erase us and everything, uh, everything around us will slowly vanish. And then we will be uh, forgotten by the people. So uh, the uh, the um, the uh, the author says that you know our life is like a, a vapor on the uh, on the water, or uh, he, he also says that uh, we are like the grass. Uh, when the wind flows, you know uh, the grass has been rooted, and even the very trace where the grass has grown is not there. So that's how our life is. With that, we will move on to the next phase where vanity explored. Here we see uh, from chapter 3 to 6, it explains, summarizes, I'm just summarizing it because we need to come uh, <clears throat> for a better understanding. So there are examples for vanity here and there is a beautiful poem that there is a time for every season in the world. It's a very beautiful poem. Let me see if I can read it. We are in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. It says a time to be born, a time to time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain and a time to loss, a time to keep and a time to throw away, <clears throat> and a time to tear and a time to sew, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time to war and a time to peace. We, we see here there are seven sets of uh, these uh, short lines which has been shared here. Here we see the author talking about the value of time. There is a time for every season. And even God had this time. In time, God prepared Jesus. He sent into this world in time. And we also see Jesus himself talking about time when he was living on this earth. When, uh, when his uh, mother approached him to convert the water into wine, he said, my, uh, women, my time is not yet come. You are seeking for that appropriate time. And even when at the time of cross, he said, okay, my time has come. He's telling the disciples, okay, my time has come. I need to be handed over. So we see that Jesus walked in perfect timing. So even God orchestrates everything in perfect time in this world. So there is a time. So Solomon talks about immutability of God, which is inevitability of death and oppression and uh, evil of man, forgetting of strong leaders. And here he talks about the laziness, the busyness or the failures or, uh, you know, working for money. One thing is for sure in life is death. And when death occurs, whatever we are achieved in this world, we do not carry them with us. So keeping this in mind, we need to lead our life uh, seeking goodness for others as we seek it for ourselves. So uh, later he moves to chapter 7 to 9, uh, which has been titled as Vanity Expanded. So in this passage, we see similar to the book of Proverbs. Here he talks about the difference between the wisdom and folly. He also talks about the advice for dealing with kings, rewards of fearing God. Uh, uh, rewards of fearing God and uh, more on the certainty of death because death is something that makes us be aware of our, our life being in vanity and how sensitive our life is. So keeping this in our mind, we will conduct ourselves with fear of God and do good to others at the same time. Just like how Jesus said, you need to, as you love yourself, love your neighbors as you love yourself. So keeping others in mind, we will conduct ourselves well because our life is not for sure and our life is in, uh, it, it's like the vapor, 
the water. So he talks about death. It can happen to anyone at any time, at any part of their life. So like a story, um, you know, he also shares a story, like a story um, goes like this. Um, there's a certain city with few men living in it and a king came uh, uh, to capture the whole city and he surrounds the whole city with a big army and he seizes them. And now, as helpless as the people in that city could be, and there comes a poor wise man who comes to help this help to save the city so he he turns up he comes up with a plan and he, he reaches out to this particular king and he delivers the whole city with his wisdom now though it is a good story but the people in that city forgets the person who saved that city and their life mm -hmm. hence here we see the author is comparing israel forgot god who saved them from the slavery and also later part we see them how God saved them from the other kingdoms around them who's trying to destroy them utterly. But then Israel, as it grew, again it try it tends to forget God time and again. And with this, as author explained this, he moves on to the other next chapter, 11, and he, he talks about, you know, vanity has been cleared, exonerated. So uh, in uh, in chapter 11, verse 1, can one of us please turn to chapter 11, verse 1 and read that for us, please? Chapter 11, verse 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Amen. Thank you. So here we see it talks about a proverb, uh, not a hoarding or an advertisement, but a proverb for generosity. Give, give, give. God is giving you for you to be a blessing. Even in the New Testament, we see that, uh, you know, uh, the word says uh, it's blessed to give than to receive. So here the Ecclesiastes, the author says, give, be a blessing because our life is in vanity and also in verse 7 can you also please uh, read verse 7 in the same chapter truly the light is sweet and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun yeah yeah so that means if a person lives for a longer years let him rejoice but let him remember that the days of darkness will be many and all that comes is vanity and with this we will uh, uh, move on uh, the whole this is summarizing the whole chapter of 11 and first part of 12 and it says that um, if that's not disheartening enough the teacher also can't stop uh, talking about death all the way throughout the book especially in this poem near the end he says that is the great equalizer and it renders meaningless most of her daily activities and it divorces the wise and the fool, the rich and the poor. No matter who you are, what you have done, good or bad, we all are going to die. And that is something that we cannot uh, escape from it. It is inescapable. So keeping that in our mind, we need to conduct a life worthy or a pleasing to God. So with these two ideas in hand that, you know, uh, uh, the teacher considers these two things like um, the first few chapters, we see life is vanity. And in the last conclusion part, we see how uh, death is uh, inescapable. So keeping these two activities in mind, uh, we see that there is a kind of hope that the author creates in us. So you think working hard is going to make life worth it think about the stress that we will toil during that time all the anxiety and the sleepless nights by the time we actually earn some wealth we are going to lose it we cannot we will be so old that we are not unable to enjoy it so anyway we may think okay let my let me pass it on to my children or to someone and they may not even uh, because they have not earned it they may not even know the 
value of the wealth that you um, uh, stressfully earned throughout your life. So they may lavishly spend it because they do not know the value of it. And later we also think, okay, uh, so... <clears throat> Uh, so instead of me uh, keeping the whole thing to the next generation or to pass it on to somebody else, so let me enjoy it. So what the author describes here is the man may think, okay, let me enjoy. So he goes into a pleasure mode and he tries to enjoy his life by going into vacations or going for a party every weekend. But remember, again, after a weekend, there is always a Monday. You know, you need to again struggle, slog and same comes. So again, he says, everything is vanity, vanity, vanity. So what does a teacher uh, uh, gives us a message? He says, um, yes, we may be a pleasure seeker. It is very important. Uh, but then what we need to do is the teacher is acknowledging something very important here is as we lead our life and as uh, you know, we are aware now that everything around is vanity and also the second, uh, the last phase of the book where he talks about death is for sure. So keeping all this in mind, how we need to conduct our life. How we need to conduct our life is by keeping the fear of God in our mind. That's what the Proverbs talk about. We need to lead our life, uh, uh, lead our life with the fear of God. Because in the fear of God is where we get our wisdom, is where we get our understanding, is where we also get our knowledge. So, so the, the author in this book also encourages us to fear God. Fear God in our life. So that we may lead a better life, that we may give a meaning to the life, even if it is a short time, we may give meaning to our life. And if it is a long term under the sun, enjoy it. God has blessed you because the scripture says when we walk fearing God, our life will be expanded because you are setting an example to others. So you may set a living example to many other people. So, uh, so the author says, lead a life fearing to God that you may be a blessing to many. So with this, we may have a question in our mind uh, saying, how do we live a life in midst of all this vanity? Simple, again and again, uh, the author says, fear God. Fear God as the life is a gift that we have received from God uh, with uh, being mindful of God, that God is watching over us and our life has been watched. Our thought has been watched. Nothing that is uh, in this world we can do that is hidden from God. Being all mindful we need to lead our life that pleases god and at the same time you can enjoy your life by doing good things around us and have a good friendship with everyone go <coughs> sorry uh, go for a, a family outing have a good meal spend time with your loved ones enjoy your sunny day but be mindful that our life is short let's live a life meaningful with fear of God. And even when we pass away, when the death hits us, we may not have any regrets because we have set a good example. We have set our, uh, our family in the right way so that we can uh, uh, pass away uh, the pattern in a good manner, uh, keeping God in midst of our mind, our art, our family, and in all that we orchestrate things around us. So, Though we may not have control over things that are happening around us, but one thing uh, the author says that when we set a focus, uh, focus on God, he says there are certain things that God can be control of our life. Okay, yes, the book talks about vanity, but at the same time, it also gives us a hope. So in chapter 12, at the end, we see that the author uh, brings a conclusion and he says that teacher's words are very important for us to hear. As a shepherd staff with a goat uh, and he uh, he point uh, with a pointy end, he might hurt us. When it pokes us, 
and uh, the teacher says he is trying to focus to get us moving to the right direction towards the greater wisdom so the author wants us that we can actually take the teacher's words and you know um, accept it and apply it in our lives so that we may not be uh, uh, puzzled at handling our life situation but we can be well prepared so with this the author encourages us with a message of hope saying that uh, no matter what challenge we may face in our life but we need to be hope, uh, we need to have this hope that god is with us god will lead us and the hope that one day god will clear away all the vanity and bring justice to our world and in that hope uh, that we should fuel our life with honesty integrity because we are leading our life in front of god so despite the fact that uh you know many situations in our life we may not understand it may bring a lot of uh, uh complex but then trust god trust god in all your life that god is uh, uh god is a source of all wisdom he can handle things for you he will make a way where there's no way um you know he leads you so yeah this book completely encourages and uh, tells us don't run into the worldly pleasure worldly things because everything brings vanity and the author solomon we know that he was in highest in power highest in wisdom he had all the pleasure wealth of this world and uh, yes especially with the women he had about 700 wives and then concubines and all that so he says everything is vanity i have experienced i have tasted i have gone through in my life and everything is vanity and all that we need is god which i have missed it with all my wisdom but you don't do that so we need to take the author's words literally because a man who's gone through everything and with his life experience he is sharing his wisdom to us so that you and i when we go through different stages in our life we may not do the mistakes what he did so he gives us a warning and also a message of hope and he also shares his life experience the mistakes that he did so that we may not do from it so it is a great book of learning praise god for this wisdom and much more can be understood when we personally read so i would encourage all of us to please read this book as it is so with this any questions anything that you would like to share please go ahead before we could move on to the next book and we have a reflection question here are we living our lives having eternity in our mind or are we still searching for a meaning and purpose in life by seeking wealth fame pleasure success but we need to remember in all that we do we need to honor god honor and obey god okay so open to class is there anything that you would like to share ask before we could move on to the next book class anything that you would like to share okay i take your silence as that everyone have understood so we can move on to the next book but everyone are there right yes ma'am uh, am i going in fast pace are you all able to understand yes ma'am is it okay is this face yes. okay yes ma'am okay okay great thank you thank you so much so we will move on to the next book song of songs which is also known as song of solomon so this book is also called a song of solomon and it has a collection of love poems and in the, uh, which is also the last book in the bible's wisdom book so final of the three books written by solomon um, we look at the three books we looked at uh, proverbs the book of ecclesiastes and now uh, the song of songs which is also known as song of solomon so uh, the uh, they say uh, the majority of proverbs was written by solomon when he was very matured in his life 
okay and then uh, we see a uh, book of ecclesiastes was written at the uh, old age you know when he 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 had a experience of whole lot in his life and at the end he considers everything vanity and he comes to the realization of life what he actually uh, could have done which he didn't do and what others can do you know he gives the whole experience of life so this book ecclesiastes he wrote in a very um, old age okay at the uh, mostly at the end of his age um, now the song of solomon we see uh, this book uh, uh, we see that he has written at a very youthful uh, the writing and the way he explains about himself is sounds like you know solomon was very young and youth and uh, even before you could uh, get married to many women you know he just writes it and here we see a writing of a wedding song it describes his love for and married uh, a marriage to a beautiful country girl called the uh, uh, shulamite uh, we see that in the song of songs chapter 6 verse 13 and the song records the dialogue between a bride that is shulamite and a beloved the king of israel which is solomon a man with great wisdom and we see later the chorus of uh, the daughters of jerusalem occasionally addressing the love so well this book could have written approximate date is 950 bc in jerusalem and the very purpose of this book is um we have split it like the review and the preview the review can be the song of solomon demonstrates the love that should exist between a husband and a wife and where it needs to glorify uh, uh, glorify uh, glorify a uh, a uh, uh, glorify in a, a wedded love literal application speaks of the blissful love of solomon and his bride in some of the chapters we see especially in chapter 4 and 5 and later we see the preview the christian love through the ages have seen in the book has been illustrated of christ's love for his bride that is the church and it teaches about the sanctity of courtship and marriage and also it teaches about the essential nature of the human of a man and a woman in marriage and later we also see the secondary sense of the same book the book um, we see that uh, it has to be considered as the old testament illustration the love of god for his people and 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 the love of christ and in the new testament we see for the love of christ for his bride the church in the new testament is uh, christ showcasing his love for the bride we can understand it that way or we can interpret it in that way and the unique features of this book is there are two the song of songs is unique among the bible books for its intimate look at sexual love and the second is it is one of the only two books that do not mention the name of god but the expression itself just like the book of esther we see the god's heart in this book um yeah so this book has eight chapters or we can call it as eight love poetry and while there is an introduction and there is a conclusion in this book so the book doesn't have any kind of rigid literary design and uh, that's because it's a collection of poems uh, they are not meant to be dissected or taken apart they are meant to be read as a flow Uh, as a flow and simply enjoy it so in we'll start with verse 1 we'll so start with chapter 1 of chapter 1 and verse so here we see the first line of the book tells us that it's the song of songs or the song of solomon which in hebrew idiom like the holy of holies or the king of kings it's a hebrew way of saying the greatest thing so this is the greatest songs of all songs or the greatest songs of solomon so we see the author of the book is the king solomon which is recorded uh in the first line itself and the song of songs yeah so we read the poem we discover that the main voice is that of a woman called the beloved and while there is also a male voice which is king solomon for the lover in the song of songs there are the only ones in the world for each other and the solomon uh, was also known for his wisdom for his poetry skill uh, his love of learning about every part of life and eventually solomon became the father of wisdom literature in israel 
And also, uh, is legacy is your carried on through a collection of love poems that explore the human experience of love and uh, sexual desire. And later part of the same chapter, we see the uh, po uh, the opening poem introduces us to the basic theme of this book. So we hear the voice of this young woman uh, who delights in a man, a shepherd, and now she's not married to him yet, but it becomes uh, clear that they are engaged and they cannot wait to be together. So, um, yeah, we see that throughout the poem. For the From the introduction, the poem flows back and forth about the women's voice and then the man shifting. Uh, we see it, it's like a movie. It's like, you know, a drama or different scenes comes after each other and without any kind of... Uh, clear linear sequence of storyline, just a conversation of, of how attracted each other are towards each other. And however, the poem moves in the uh, uh, symphonic cycle and the key images and ideas get repeated and developed. So one of the basic theme uh, uniting the poem is the intense desire of this couple for each other expressed throughout um, throughout uh, this book, Seeking and Finding Them. So after the poem, opening of this poem, we see uh, at some instant they are separated, but on the hunt for one another. So the woman calls out or uh, she'll wake up from a dream and go looking for a lover. And more than once, they'll, uh, they'll find each other and they will embrace. And then right from then things start to get little uh, racy and the scene will suddenly end and the new one will start and they are separated again and looking after each other and it goes on this way and another repeated theme is in the whole book we see the joy uh, uh, the joy when they are together uh, um, they they just showcase it how uh, you know they're getting attracted with each other and they like to be together so the multiple times they are, uh, they'll pause and they'll describe each other. Uh, they get attracted towards each other. So yeah, uh, we see that whole thing in the story about how a, a lover's conversation would be. And all this has been narrated in the Hebrew poetry and not, uh, uh, not in a visual format. Now, <clears throat> With this, we'll move on to chapter eight, which is the last chapter. So it all comes together in the conclusion uh, where uh, they pause to summarize uh, that the poem are all about love. And, uh, <clears throat> and um, you know, in, in especially in chapter eight from uh, verse six to nine, it talks about love is uh, strong as death. Its passion are as severe as the grave, and its flashes are of fire, a divine flame of many waters, cannot extinguish love, or uh, rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, you would be utterly scorned. So the poem highlights the power and intensity of love, how it's both beautiful but also at the, at the same time, it is dangerous, like the a fire. Uh, love can destroy people if it's abused or life-giving if it's protected. Yes, we see that so and so true even now around us. So ultimately, love expresses the limitless human longing to know and be fully known and desired by one another. Uh, and also, love is one of the most inspiring and mysterious experience in human life. And as part of the Bible's wisdom tradition, this book says it's a gift from God. And after this, there's an, uh, 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 there's an old poem which talks about money, that love, um, uh, uh, money cannot buy love and all that. And um, we see that, you know, um, they are separated once again. The couple you have been separated, and you know they start hunting each other. And he calls to hear the voice, and uh, she begs him to run away with her. And that's how the book ends, just totally open ended. So we may think, why is it open ended? But that's a lot like love, which never truly concludes because there's always a more to discover and pursue in your beloved. And so true uh, um, that you know love has no end, and neither. Does this 
book. Uh, now we can compare this song of songs into uh, you know into our life. Now there may be a question: Why this love? The song of songs poetry. Uh, what is it doing in the Bible? And it has no mention about God. So um, we will look into it according to the Hebrew history or uh, the Jewish tradition, the way it has been written as the allegory. So each. Uh, character in this book is a symbol so the women is israel and the man is god so there is love in the symbol of covenant between god and israel like uh, you know god made in mount sinai and uh, and giving the Torah, the law to the people of Israel. So uh, we see the view flowed into the Christian tradition, but the characters were swapped. So it's about so in the old tradition, we saw how God gave the law to the people and uh, the women, uh, you know. Yeah. And now we are relating it into the uh, into the uh, Christian tradition that is in the New Testament. But the characters are now swapped. So it's about uh, Christ love for his people, the church. <clears throat> and the interpretation was inspired by Paul's word in Ephesians chapter 5. You see uh, that the Christian is the husband's love for his wife is a symbol of Christ's love for the church. So what's interesting here is that in the last hundred years, the archaeological discoveries among the Israelites' ancient neighbor and the neighbors are, uh, like uh, the Egypt or the Babylon have turned up all kinds of ancient love poetry. And that very similar language is, uh, is similar to the Song of Songs. So we see that the love poetry was a meaningful part of Israel's culture and their tradition and how they expressed each other in the environment where they lived that time. So we need to read this book at the culture tradition, keeping the author, how they expressed it in their mind. So which led most scholars today to view the Song of Songs as what is present itself as an arrangement of Israel's love poetry reflecting on the divine gift of God's love to us. But that doesn't mean that it's only an ancient love poet, uh, but the key feature of this poem that sticks out when we read them uh, part of Old Testament, and that's the overwhelming part use of the Garden uh, the garden of Eden as an imaginary. So here he repeats the Garden of Eden and the idyllic scene between the married couple in the early chapter of Genesis. So the image of the man and the woman uh, whom God created was uh, vulnerable, uh, but completely later was unified and safe with one another uh, through uh, through through Christ. So this uh, resonates in the background of the Song of Songs. So it is as if these poems uh, we are witnessing the love of couple uh, whose relationship is untainted by selfless. Uh, by selfishness and sin but later we see ultimately the song holds how to hope that even though in our own relationship we have been uh, distorted or selfish sin and we have fallen but we can uh, uh, we can uh, uh, we can uh, be uh, we can be regenerated or we can come together with the love of God, which can transcend our life, which can give meaning to our life. So uh, the gift of God is God's love itself. And we have that love permeated into us. And this can transform us and the love towards uh, people around us. So the Song of Song is compared to the love of God to his children, ultimately, like, yeah. Uh, with this uh, keeping in mind, we can uh, summarize the all three books, which Solomon writes, the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs through one one video, which I would like to share it at the end of our class right now. And um, yeah, before that, I just uh, put some highlights that we covered from this book. We can go through this. These may be some of the highlights that we cover. that we covered and with this I will uh, share a video. Just give me a minute as I share a video.
please let me know as I play the video. One of us, please let me know if the audio is clear. Okay. Was it audible? Was it clear? Were you able to hear the audio? No, ma'am. No. Okay. In the story of the Bible, King Solomon was the wisest ruler that Israel Is ever Is it had. clear? And there are three books in the Hebrew scriptures connected to him. Yes, yes ma'am. Song of songs. They pass down the leg. You can wear a headset if you all have, because there are a lot of background sounds very effectively. They have created this video. If you all have a ear headset, please uh, wear it as you all enjoy watching this video. Solomon was the wisest ruler that Israel ever had. And there are three books in the Hebrew scriptures connected to him. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Songs. They pass down the legacy of Solomon's wisdom, but in a surprising way. So let's talk about how to read the books of Solomon. Okay, to really appreciate the story of Solomon's wisdom, we have to go back to the Garden of Eden, where God created humanity, male and female. Right, Adam and Eve. And God commissions them to rule the world together in intimacy and love. Kings and queens of creation. Now, in order to rule, you need to be wise. And the humans have a choice about how to gain wisdom. Yeah, they could live by God's wisdom, which will lead to life. Or they could become wise in their own eyes. And that's what they choose, to take the knowledge of good and bad into their own hands. And immediately, the intimacy between man and woman is broken. They hide their bodies from each other and then from God. Their choice leads to division and death. But the story holds out hope for a future human who will make the right choice and rely on God's wisdom. Like King Solomon, he prayed that God would give him the knowledge to know good from bad so he could rule with true wisdom. Exactly. He reverses the failure of Adam and Eve, and it leads to abundance. In Solomon's day, every Israelite sat in peace under their own fruit tree. Oh, it's like he's creating Eden. Well, for a while. But then Solomon fails. He marries hundreds of women from other nations, and he's deceived to follow their gods. And this begins Israel's long descent into self-destruction. And so when we turn to the books of Solomon, we're invited to learn wisdom from his successes and his failures. Got it. So let's start with Proverbs. Okay, so the book of Proverbs is most well known for the hundreds of short, memorable sayings that teach us how to live by God's wisdom. Like, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and don't be wise in your own eyes. In Proverbs, living by God's wisdom instead of your own is called the fear of the Lord. Like in the book's opening paragraph, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, Proverbs isn't just memorable sayings. It actually begins with a lot of poetry. Yes, nine chapters of speeches from Solomon to his royal sons. He tells them to pursue God's wisdom, which is symbolized as an elegant woman. Wisdom is a woman? Yes. So remember, in the Garden of Eden, the man and the woman's intimacy was violated by their failed search for wisdom. But now in Proverbs, humans who reunite with God's wisdom become what Adam and Eve failed to be, wise human rulers. Proverbs 3 even says that when we embrace Lady Wisdom, we're taking hold of the tree of life. Now we're the ones in the garden. Exactly. Proverbs is saying that every day we all stand before the tree with our own choice to make. And Solomon urges us, choose wisdom and life. Got it. So how does Ecclesiastes fit into Solomon's story? 
Well, in this book, it's like we're meeting Solomon near the end of his life, and he offers some sober reflections. Life is hevel. That's the Hebrew word for vapor or smoke, which is unpredictable and uncontrollable. And he's constantly talking about life under the sun. That is life outside of the garden. How it's confusing and difficult. Right. Even when I live by God's wisdom, life can be full of disappointments. Leading up to the ultimate disappointment: your own death. That's depressing. But at the end of the book, he says we should strive to live by wisdom and the fear of the Lord, just with more realistic expectations. Got it. Well, maybe the next book will cheer us up. The Song of Songs, a love poem between a man and a woman, and it'll make you blush. Yeah, on its basic level of meaning, this book is racy Hebrew love poetry. But remember, in Proverbs, humanity's pursuit of wisdom was portrayed with the symbolism of a man pursuing a woman in a garden. But in this song, it's the woman who's searching and longing for her lover. Yes, it's a poetic image of Lady Wisdom pursuing us so that we can have life. In fact, the song ends with a poem about how this lady's love is more powerful than death itself. So the song works on two levels: it's celebrating humans' desire for intimacy and saying that that desire points to humanity's ultimate purpose: to be united with God and His wisdom, so we can rule united with each other. Exactly. This is why the song ends with the man and the woman united in love under a fruit tree. So the story of Solomon. And these three books invite us to see ourselves within the whole biblical story. Yes, they're about how God designed all of us to rule the world by His wisdom, so that we can all find true life. So I would encourage each of us to share your views, your thoughts on these three books that we uh, uh, that we studied yesterday and today. Uh, that is the Book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Songs. So, if anyone would like to share or add something new that we can learn all together, please feel free to go ahead. Any questions, anything that you would like to share? Anyone in the class, Brother Lubega, Elisha, you would like to add on, Brother Subhashish, anyone in the class? Add to the wisdom books. Okay, as the time is up, maybe one of us can uh, dismiss us with a word of prayer. Can I request? Uh, yeah, Jeffrey Nagre, uh, great. Anyone in the class? Brother Lubega, you would like to dismiss us with a word of prayer, please? Father in heaven, we thank you for today as we are passing through the book of. Proverbs and Exodus. Father, just as King Solomon wrote and said in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, that for everything there is a season and a time for everything, everything, purpose, and uh, the earth. Lord, we are here to thank you. We know this is a time of learning. So, Lord, let, let everybody in this class use this opportune moment to learn more about God's word, especially the words of King Solomon. Since he was a man who saw it all, if you, he can be a great general to guide us in this walk of life. And let everybody take him as an example. We do pray and believe that everything is going to be as it was and as it is and as it will be in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we say, Amen. 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 Brother, brother. Yes, I see some comments I see about some the videos.
Yes, um, you know, uh, especially when we study through the history of the Old Testament, you know, only theory or only verbal conversation uh, sometimes uh, make it very monotonous. But when we add certain uh, pictures through a PowerPoint slide or when we add certain videos, it just makes us interesting. You know, it makes the book also interesting and it open up our Im imagination so that we can understand the book in a much better way than what it is been thought or said okay so that's the whole intention to keep this old testament book very interesting and you know very simple in the way that we can understand in our times okay so i'm just making use of all the tools that are available for us it has been created god in his wisdom uh, I, I have been raised so many people around us uh, to interpret the bible in a much better way where uh, this generation our generation can understand so as i study and do some researches praise god i'm you know god gives such videos in hand so that it may be a blessing to all of us so that even i as i teach i also learn much more Thank you so much for being a blessing and yeah, God bless. See you all in the next class.